people are so heavily critical of not just the crypto space, but specifically NFTs. We, we look at these incredible case, cases with, you know, Terra like imploding and things like that. And it's like, how, how many times is that has money laundering and, and all these same issues that occur and like happened in fiat? Like it's just, it happens every day. And it's really important for us to, to see that there is regulation happening because that does allow for a larger adoption that does allow for more protection for customers, crypto and, and regular um, fiat stocks. And seeing how entwined those things are, it's, it's even more pertinent that um, some regulation get, get put in. And that's all a good thing for all of us, I think. What up, NFT Now family? We are live in Brooklyn and changing it up for this episode of the NFT Now podcast. This is NFT Now Presents, the state of NFTs in Brooklyn, New York. We have some incredible guests for you. Can't wait for you to check it out. I am Matt Medved, co-founder and CEO of NFT Now. Uh, and we have an incredible panel today, some incredible panelists, and really excited to dig into this discussion. So to kick things off with this beautiful backdrop, uh, I'm just going to have each of our panelists give a brief introductions, and then we'll, uh, we'll dive in. Thanks. Thanks, Matt. Thanks for having me. My name is Duncan Cock Foster. I'm a co-founder of Nifty Gateway. And I've... Thank you. Thank you. I, I've been in NFTs full time since 2018. So I've seen NFTs in many different states and excited for this panel. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> give it up for Duncan. Hey, everybody. My name is Mech. Um, thanks, Matt, for having me, NFT Now. Um, I am an artist first and an educator second, um, but primarily an educator in the NFT space. Um, I guess if you know me at all, you know me from my 18-hour Twitter and Clubhouse spaces, um, kind of a, of a machine when it comes to sharing what I know about the space. Uh, currently, the uh, innovation consultant for Deadfellas and head of uh, community for Steve Aoki. Um, and yeah, recently just been doing a lot of consulting, trying to uh, figure out the best way to distill what I understand about this space to as many folks as possible, primarily, primarily non-white guys. <laughs> this is my focus. Um, yeah. No, and I, and, I, and I say that because, um, I mean, don't get me wrong, I technically onboarded Gary V in a clubhouse space, but like, um, I think I've done enough for white guys is what I'm saying, no. <laughs> no, but uh, I think about it in terms of like, white guys can walk out of their front door and get help and they don't need me. So if I get to choose how I spend my time and energy, I wanna spend it with people who are gonna have a difficulty, who are not gonna be as um, bullish on asking questions and, and kind of digging and getting the value out of the space. So um, yeah, just focusing on that, that particular group of people and hopefully, um, yeah, helping people understand how to move into the future. Give it up for Mac. Hi, um, I'm Gossamer Ferris. I'm not sure how I'm gonna follow that. That was so lit. <laughs> yeah, you're good, you're um, good. <laughs> I'm a fine artist and tattooer, and I've been in the NFT space since um, March of 2021. I'm the founder of Tiger Bob NFT. If you saw any of the, ow, woo, we got some Tiger Bob holders in here. Um, if you if you saw any of the little um, uh, business cards floating around, please take one. Um, yeah, so I'm the founder of that, and I've also um, my primarily working in one of one fine art. Um, and it's, it's been a pleasure to be part of the space and also be uh, one of the uh, founding members of the Woody's NFT project. Uh, oh. We had a historic donation of over $200,000 to plant trees uh, for the future. Which yeah. Very excellent. Big on philanthropy, big on, um, you know, being unapologetically myself in this space. And that's very important. And the, the representation we see up here is very important. And I, I'm very excited to, to be part of this panel today. Thank you. Yeah. Give it up for Gossamer. Incredible. Well, I'm really excited for this conversation, too. Um, this is the state of NFTs, and it's an interesting time to be talking about the state of NFTs. Um, you know, they often say that bear markets are for the builders, and if anyone's been paying attention to NFT sales volume this week, it's pretty clear we are well and truly in a bear market. Um, so with that in mind, what are each of you working on? How are each of you staying grounded during this time? Uh, and what, what are you sort of focusing on? I'm still hard at work at, at Nifty Gateway. We're more dedicated than ever to building NFT infrastructure. I mean, we started off in a bear market. I, I think now is a, it's definitely a bad time in NFTs, but 
I, I think it's better than 2018 was, where we were sort of, in crypto, it was like post the ICO boom. I mean, when we, when we first started, a lot of the people that were founding NFT companies at the same time as us, you know, three months later, we would talk to them and they were like, we gave up, we don't think NFTs are gonna happen, or we think it's gonna happen in like five years or 10 years. And they were totally wrong. I mean, it, it happened like basically immediately after they quit the space, so. <laughs> right. Um, I think, uh, you know, like some, some stuff that Nifty specifically has been um, building, you know, we, we just moved our platform to being like a, a mix of like custodial and non-custodial, which I think is absolutely huge. We have custody, which like helps people get started in the NFT space and makes it really, really easy for them to buy NFTs. And then once you've learned more about NF, you know, Web3 and crypto and how it works, then you can graduate to a, to a non-custodial experience. And we have a bunch of other exciting stuff that I can't talk about, but you know, stay posted. Um, and yeah, I, I think overall I would say that uh, I think in a, in a raging bull market, you get all these things that you, you just get a lot of froth. And then a bear market is sort of like a forest fire and it destroys all the use cases that didn't actually have value in it. Over time, the stuff that does actually have value is what rises to the top. And I think that's what we try and stay focused on. You know, like Nifty was, from the, from the beginning, it was all about empowering artists and like helping artists make money. Um, I think NFTs got away from that a little bit and we want to get back to our roots and like help artists make money again because that's what NFTs are doing for the world that I think is amazing. So that's what I would say. There's, there's quite a few things that I've been working on. Um, I mean, like I said, I'm an artist first and I haven't really been an artist in this space as much because I'm focused on the community more. Um, but I've been working on a project since last year. Um, we're rolling in August will be, like mid-August will be a year in, of someone drawing me. I'm not gonna say anything more than that. <laughs> um, so that's exciting. Um, I think where I am right now is um, I started in January with uh, Stevie Oki's team and I'm getting to the end of my contract with them, um, finding you know new partners for them to kind of continue on without me and um, looking at ways to continue to educate. So now I'm doing more like internal education with brands, um, having some interesting conversations with like Converse, Jordan Nike, um, Spring Hill um, and their robot arm and trying to think about the other side of the conversation because my curriculum is really based on like the individual. I think a lot about how to help, uh, you know, artists and collectors come into the space because it's a very like, you know, I want to say people centric space. Um, and so the conversations that I'm having now are the opposite side of that coin and thinking about how to make sure that brands have better optics about how to operate because a lot of them will like kind of bulldoze their way into the space and think like, oh, I'm just going to bring my existing business in and it's not really the way that that would work best. Um, so yeah, giving them some insight on how to relinquish power and revisit those splits and like really basic math around what it looks like to... Um, to properly commiserate artists for their work and their value. Um, so that's been really, really interesting. And, um, and I think like beyond that, um, just extending into like what it looks like to formalize my education and build a dip around that because I think I've been, I've been waiting, waiting for me to wake up to learn, <laughs> which is not uh, scalable. Um, so just thinking about ways to formalize my education so that I can share it with a, a broader uh, you know, audience. So I've been uh, very busy building Tiger Bob, which I'm proud to say that I launched right in the middle of the bear market and sold out, which was very exciting. Ow! Thank you. <laughs> um, I, I, I think that, it, you know, d despite what happened with the market, um, it, it, was, it was very much in my intention to take what I learned from the start of, you know, my exploration and making collectibles and, and fine art and NFTs and building a product and a, a brand that actually made sense and could and could scale up in a reasonable and, and sustainable way for myself and my team. Um, it was really important to be able to still retain the ability to create one of one artwork and, and really retain that fine art aspect of what I build um, and, and not dilute that in a kind of way with um, the brand Tiger Bob, which is why every single one was handmade. It took six months. Um, and so um, been spending a lot of the last few months since our mint out at the end of May, um, you know, keeping 10% of everything we build to um, going back to um, charity. So that's always something that will be ongoing forever. 
Um, and we're also you know, working on building merchandise, um, creating all different kinds of um, products and, 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 and making meaningful artwork um, and just growing in a sustainable, regular person way and not like um, the, the kind of very uh, fast paced, um, crazy projects that kept being dropped last um, summer around this time, I think. It was a little bit um, of, a, it was a little bit of a shock, I think, to the, the whole space at, at how much was being dropped and how much noise there was and being, to, being able to disambiguate between what is actually, um, what is actually providing value to the space versus what is just a cash grab where people just uh, took money and then ran, which happened quite a lot. It, uh, it's very, um, very nice to be able to see that um, people are really thinking carefully about what they're spending their time building, what they're spending their time um, investing in, and people are looking more long-term, which is more profitable and more sustainable for real projects and real creators who are building something valuable in the space. Absolutely. Yeah, give it up on that, on that note, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I always say it's like, you know, pay attention to those who are consistently showing up during the bear market, because those are going to be the people who are really leading uh, the next chapters uh, during the bull. It was really interesting, if you look back on the past year and a half, um, to look at some of the use cases that really helped drive mainstream adoption or, or awareness, um, you know, digital art, digital collectibles, and then also emerging use cases like photography, music, uh, and many more. Uh, so as we look to the future, I'm curious to hear from each of you, like, what are some of the use cases that you're most excited about uh, as we navigate the bear and move towards the next? So I, I think, you know, in a bull market, people get, like, way too excited, and they, like, tend to be wrong about the state of the future because they, like, they think something is, is that's really cool is going to happen, but it won't. And I think in a bear market, the opposite tends to happen, and people forget about all the cool things that have happened. You know, all the artists who have like achieved the life that they want to live because of NFTs. Um, the the thing I think about art is uh, I, I like to call it closing the passion gap. This is from a from a study and and people who are like studying NFT collectors versus physical art collectors. Um, about 65% of NFT art collectors buy art because they are passionate about it and they emotionally connect with it, compared to 95% of physical art collectors. And then those numbers are reversed for people who are buying it to make money. About 95% of NFT buyers are buying art because they think they're gonna make money, and about 65% of physical art buyers are buying art because they make money. So if you look at the two markets, you know, NFTs are, are way more speculative. That, the, the data like shows that. Um, I think that you know, the 65% the who are just buying art because they love it need to be more vocal and need to be like, hey, we're not doing this to make money. We're doing this because, like, this looks amazing on my wall. And I, I love the artists and I love what they're doing. And it, until we close the passion gap, I think NFTs are going to continue to be speculative because so many people are coming in to make money. And, you know, that, that is great in the short term and it can lead to, like, some artists getting rich. But, like, it ultimately is what creates these very gnarly like boom and bust cycles that we've seen. Um, and so yeah, I'm, I'm really passionate about closing the passion gap is, is what I call it. Um, and then some other use cases that I think are happening that are really, really cool. Um, you know, I think more people are, are like embracing NFTs as digital collectibles. I think a lot, of, a lot of companies are experimenting with how to use NFTs with their loyalty reward programs, which doesn't sound that sexy, but I think you know, loyalties, rewards are actually a, a gigantic business and it's a way to reach people who would never, who would not usually buy an, an, you know, a, an NFT artwork and get them buying NFT artwork. So that, that's something I'm really excited about. Yep. Um, I realized like when you said merchandise earlier, I got all like, mm. um, I'm super excited about like the, the organic utility of fashion in NFTs. Um, and so like part of my personal project is very heavily focused on fashion. Um, anybody who knows me knows I like to dress. I like to show up. I dress down for you. I, I don't want to hurt anybody today. <laughs> Um, but you, no, you, it's, you dressing down is still showing up half yeah, of the you, people. Yeah, you see, that's what I'm saying. Like, I, I gave you a little lukewarm today. Um, but like for me, that's one of those uh, utilities, specifically because I come from like a sort of like sneakerhead approach. Like, I don't really consider myself a sneakerhead or like a collector in that way. But in, in the way that I, I think about on onboarding 
I approach people from that particular community a specific way because they already do the thing, right? Like they, they already sort of live in the world of collectibles. And so translating what they do to this space and sort of illuminating how this works is a lot easier because they are already operating in that sort of mindset of like, I want to get this because there's a limited edition of this, right? And so when I, when I think about that, I also think about like the technology that comes along with that, right? So like being able to secure, authenticate, verify physical goods in on chain in in the you know sort of like web3 space for those who so basically like folks who are worried about getting knockoffs don't have to worry about that anymore because now there are ways right so i have a friend who makes a, a technology called smart seal um we've seen um idris doing some stuff with this sort of like you know web3 verification um we know that louis vuitton is doing something similar right using like chain link to verify physical goods so the idea of like people bringing the collectible market of fashion into Web3 and it being an organic utility because people are going to buy clothes with like that same money regardless, right? This isn't a, a new uh, purchase for them. It's just reallocating it to this particular space. And we see like a lot of brands now taking um, ETH or, or crypto uh, natively in their stores, right? So I'm pretty excited about like what it looks like for people who are into like, um, I want to say like, the curation of their of their wardrobe and, and closet to like have this ability to to buy directly from people who are making goods because again that's sort of that like recapturing of you know the the artist's intent right people are are trying to make things for you to consume but not because they want to to sell you something but because they enjoy making it right and so artists being able to, to make a living selling you a good and then also being able to secure and verify and prove that you are not only like part of this community and supporter, but also like it's verifiable and it's still a, a retail value in it if you want to resell it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I definitely agree on both the points of, you know, just the subject in general of artists being able to create the things they want to create without having to sit down, write like a dissertation on why they would like to make the thing and like try to convince a few people to give them some funding so they could make the thing. It's very cool that a bunch of people can get together and literally drop like a full fledged like video game and fund it all themselves and like just take home money that actually feeds themselves and gives them some more pocket to, to make more stuff. I mean, that's like the most amazing thing about being able to drop Tiger Bob was just being able to be like completely intentional about being like, I would like to fund a brand. I would like to build these things. And if you buy my stuff, then you help support that and you also get some kind of benefits in that. And that's like the largest use case, I think, um, regardless if you're selling fine art, regardless if you're selling sneakers, regardless if you're selling, you know, you know, a magazine or a subscription, like the biggest use case is just ordinary people being able to fund their own passion projects. Um, and, and just the most amazing things about it is that freedom to not be locked into, um, you know, going into some kind of specific design or um, video game or, um, you know, specific niche job where you have to work for some corporation and do their specific project to get the experience you need to build these things that aren't even your own work. And at the end of the day, you, you still don't get to come home and, and enjoy the own pro your own project that you decided to build from scratch. Like, you actually can do your own project work with whoever you want um, and, and just enjoy yourself, which I think is the, the greatest part of it. Yeah. Amen to that. Amen to that. Duncan, I've got a question for you. I'd love to hear your perspective here. You know, uh, as we're entering this bear market, we're also looking at what seems to be sort of like a regulatory moment of reckoning for the crypto space at large. You know, seeing the fall of Luna, the fall of Celsius, Three Arrows Capital, and beyond. Um, what does this mean for the NFT space? Uh, and, and how are you thinking about this as uh, the leader of one of, of one of the leading platforms uh, in the NFT space, um, underneath also the, um, you know, the, the umbrella of Gemini? Uh, personally, my opinion is, you know, 
I, I think we've definitely seen some like shenanigans in the NFT space. Like there's definitely been some people who have like misused this technology to to do shady stuff. And there's been a few people who have been charged with fraud. But I mean honestly, like if you compare the shenanigans in the NFT space to like the shenanigans in the, the wider crypto space, it's like it's like one one hundredth or one one thousandth, you know, like the the crypto shenanigans are way, way, way worse. I mean <laughs> I, I love this term. The crypto shenanigans. shenanigans. <laughs> no, I, I mean like EOS did a, a four billion dollar ICO and they they haven't built you know, they a year later, they're like, oh, we're just not building the blockchain anymore. You know, like $4 billion, that, that, that's an insane amount of money. Like no one in NFTs has done anything like even close to, close to that. And I'm, I'm honestly like, I'm, I'm kind of shocked how little it's been like prosecuted or cracked down on. Like maybe we're starting to see the beginning of that. But like the, personally, the way I feel about this is like, we have at least five years of the government working through the, the crypto shenanigans before they get to the NFT shenanigans. <laughs> yeah, because like, it, I mean, it's not even on the same, like NFTs are, are like so much full, more full of creativity and like people who with genuine intent. And like that, that's, yeah. So not something that's like super on my mind right now, but maybe I'm wrong, I don't know, you know. Can I add to that? Like, I, I just wanted to say that also I mean, people are so heavily critical of not just the crypto space, but specifically NFTs. And I know it comes with, you know, the stigma of this new technology that everybody likes to blame for everything, which seems to be quite a trend that has continued for the past year and a half, I believe. I think we all agree on that. Um, and, and we think we, we look at these incredible case, cases with, you know, Terra like imploding and things like that. And it's like, how, how many times is that has money laundering and, and all these same issues that occur and like happened in fiat? Like it's just, it happens every day at the same scale or larger. And it's, and it's crazy how, how heavily scrutinized, um, you know, the crypto, the crypto world is on like how it's like, you know, the, just like a detriment to, to what's happening. And it's, it's, it, that always comes with every new um, technology, which is why I always take the news that is extra positive or extra negative with a grain of salt. Um, and, and it's really important for us to, to see that there is regulation happening because that does allow for a larger adoption, that does allow for more protection for customers, that does prevent people from losing the, the, the scale of you know, money that occurred, which trickled down and like, especially with Terra specifically, I mean, that shouldn't have been able to happen. And it's very unfortunate that it did happen um, because of how contagious these things are. And it's so contagious that it also impacted the regular stock market. And, and, and seeing how intertwined um, crypto and, and regular um, fiat stocks and things are, um, which is, I don't think, what a lot of people expected to happen this year with the market at all. Um, and seeing how entwined those things are, it's, it's even more pertinent that um, some regulation get, get put in. And that's all a good thing for all of us, I think. Absolutely, absolutely. Great points across the board. Um, Mac, I, I'd love to go to you. I, 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 I'm really impressed by just your rise in Web3 and NFTs, and I've been following it since the early Clubhouse days. And I remember connecting um, in those early days and really seeing you wear so many different hats in the space um, and see you and kind of be able to watch that journey has been really cool. And you know, I, I would love to hear your thoughts and, and your advice for those who are thinking about entering Web3 um, and trying to find their own like, place in this new space, like, what, what advice might you have for them based on your, the insights from your own experience? Uh, the way that I now suggest for people to approach the NFT space is to bring a problem to the table because there's so many advantages when you approach it this way. Um, I think that the true value of the NFT space is impact work, right? And it's, it's the ability to leverage these tools to solve real world problems in a real way with real capital. Um, so if you do a good job of positioning yourself, building community, building a team, and executing, you can take a couple million dollars and pour it into something you give a shit about, right? So I recommend that you approach it by bringing a problem to the table because one of the most important parts of being successful in this space is building a community that you can galvanize around a particular idea. So if you just come in wanting to sell a product, you're gonna have people who are interested in this product. But if you come into this space thinking about a problem you're trying to solve using a product, 
people are not as drawn to the idea of buying the product as much as they are supporting the idea behind why the product exists, right? So you have this opportunity to more, more so bond with people who have a shared pain point, right? You think about, like, it could be anything from, I want to make work so that I can continue to make work, or I want to solve world hunger. Anywhere in between those two things exists this space for you to, to speak really passionately about a thing you care about. And it's really, really easy to find people who want to help. So then this, this sort of problem or conundrum of like funding and paying people and building a team become a lot less required because the people who are jumping up to help you are happy to help for free. I have a list of like 325 people and I have one specific question in this uh, type form that I put together that asks about compensation because I want to know, in, in the middle of a global pandemic, what do you need? Do you, are you happy like, to volunteer for now? Do you want to work for token? Do you need to be paid a salary? And like a third of these 325 people are happy to volunteer because they want to also solve the problem that I'm trying to solve. Right? And so the, in, the idea that you need to incentivize people or pay people, while I am fully of the mind that coming from freelance, you should be paying everybody all the time, you realize that you can tap into some sweat equity to start because you're, you're building around a shared pain point. So you bring that problem to the table and, and build in public. You talk about it as much as you can, you meet people and you commune around this idea. And the passion that you have for it comes through so clearly that you find people who wanna help. And a lot of these people don't want anything in return but to solve this problem. Give, give it up for Mac, yeah. Really, really, really valuable insights there. Appreciate that. Um, Gossamer, you know, you, you launched Tiger Bob, as you said, in, in the midst of a bear market. It sold out. And, and now the work begins, you know, and, and, and then, you know, now the work begins when it comes to these kind of projects. You know, it, 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 doesn't, it doesn't stop there. An NFT sale like that is a beginning. And, and that's a very different beast. Right, running a community, a community-based NFT project, than say just releasing individual artworks as an artist, and you've seen both sides. So, I'd love to hear your perspective. Like, what have been kind of like the biggest, like the highs and the lows, and like the lessons learned and the insights from you know making that leap and and really suddenly being now as an artist accountable to a whole community as well. It's a very loaded question. Um, I, I guess I'll start with um, making the, the the leap to starting a, a, an established project um, through Woody's, which was done through Ultra DAO, one of the I think oldest DAOs in the space, um, which is a collective of artists uh, founded by um, Chris Wallace, who's who's still our still our awesome founder, and we're still working on on building something that is established within that. Um, and Woody's was one of our first biggest projects to, to happen through that. It just was like, and it was very loose. It was definitely 12 people who came together with an idea and were like, let's, let's make this happen. And, and sometimes you start and you jump the gun and, and you don't think about all of the really boring details like um, and, ensuring you have you know, IP and legal and, and finance and things like that. And I feel like, <coughs> I feel like a lot of projects started like that, and 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 especially in um, what I now understand was the bull market run. Um, you know, it's 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 hard to, to to be able to look back, and sometimes we're just like, "Whoa, we we did this. Now now what?" There's always that question sometimes, um, especially when folks um, start in something large, and and then it's not entirely expected. And, and there's always a shuffling of roles after you do a big drop like that. There's a, there's a huge reorganization that happens after you do a large mint that I don't think a lot of people understand is a, is a large part of, of what needs to be um, predicted and, and accounted for well before you even launch your project. Um, and those are a lot of the different lessons that I learned in, in trying to, to switch from just dropping artwork one at a time as an artist and, and really trying to build something that um, you plan out very carefully ahead of time. Um, you really take your time to, to ensure that you're, you communicate very clearly um, reasonable and, um, and attainable goals in the, in the near term and, and the long term. And, and ensuring you hold yourself to, to uh, standards that um, ensure that you're, you're providing something to your community and giving back and, and ensuring that expectations are not beyond um, 
some kind of hype overload, which I think is, is very contagious in the space. You'll see like something like the Goblins Project drop, and then everyone's like, everything needs to be a free mint. What are you doing? Like, what do you mean you need to pay for this? Like, it's like, you know, it's like these, these crazy expectations come and go in, 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 in fads, and it, it's, it's really hard to combat, because it's, it's like every couple days or even every two weeks, there are these crazy like cycles in the NFT space where these projects pop up and then die down and pop up and die down and 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 trying to build something long term is very difficult and and of course the space is very different now than what than what it was like last year when everyone was dropping a PFP and every project was selling out like instantly um, it is it's just a completely different world um, not only for one of one artists who are trying to drop work it's I think it's even harder for them now to just drop work um, I think that there was a point in February and March of 2021, where everybody was dropping one of one work and everything was selling, and then suddenly it wasn't in like April, and then people were like, "Wait, what? We have to do something." To it's, it's, it's just, it's just, it's just, you know, being kept quite a lot on your toes, and 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 I think that building a community around your work that um, really holds you, yourself, and and your community yourself accountable for. Um, ensuring you build on that roadmap, ensuring that you, um, you know, you're 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 doing well with your finances in a in a transparent way that that will actually make sense towards building things and not just buying yachts and houses and stuff, which a lot of people did, which I don't blame them, but you know, it's, then then there's tax days and everybody got wrecked, but you know, so this, these are, these are all like little things that people don't think about that that are little things that you know you learn and you grow with because although we're in Web three, a lot of these a lot of these processes and a lot of these um, a lot of these structures, these business structures, are still well into web th and web two, and that will that will slowly grow and change. But in the meantime, we do have to adhere to something that that does make sense from a legal and, and business standpoint. And and being able to think about those things ahead of time is is very key for everyone, e even if you're a one of one artist. I think you raised some really important points, and you know, if we think about the NFT space at large. Um, I think we're, we unfortunately have all of the like components of a mental health crisis like on our hands, and I think it's up to us as a community to really make sure that that doesn't happen, or to try and try and really create a positive impact around that. Um, when we have you know these volatile markets, these rises and falls, um, with often life changing amounts of money on the line, and beyond that social media addiction, you know, the actual pressures that come from running a platform, a community, a project, all of these things. Um, how in this like constantly going market 24 seven, takes no weekends off, like this insane context where days are months, weeks are years, everything's happening at once. How do each of you stay grounded and any, any sort of like insights that might be helpful to, to hear that others may be able to learn from your approach? I have a very simple answer, which is I no longer check Discord. It's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and seriously, you know, like, I, I think that app is like, a, it's like, frankly, it just like dopamine driven. It feels like you have to be like a dopamine addicted teenager to, to use it. And like, I, I think like it says a lot about like the state of NFTs that Discord is like the main or like one of the main apps. You know, like there's, like, you know, mo most people, like, most collectibles markets are not on Discord. That's not, like, a, a thing. And sorry, this turned into an anti-Discord rant. Um, <laughs> which, I, which I'm here for, by the way. Like, well, I, think we, I think we all That's, agree that Discord is not the way. And not we it. need, some, we need a solution. <laughs> I don't know what that solution is. but we I'm, I'm working on something, but let's get, but we'll, we'll, we'll get there. <laughs> um, I, I would say, like, a... I, I really think it comes down to like misaligned expectations, frankly, like so many people like they get into NFTs and, and I've seen this like cycle happen so many times with crypto. I, I've been full time in NFTs since 2018 and like the same cycle happened back then too, just like on a much smaller scale where people join the space and they're like, all right, that's it. Like I'm, you know, next month I'm like, I'll, I'll have made it. And like, that's like, I joined the space to like get to like go to the moon overnight and like, they're not, you know, like, I don't know if people join the, like most careers, they're like, okay, maybe if I work at this for 20 years, I'll like, I'll finally have built something of value. And like their expectations are like aligned with reality. And I, I think because crypto is such a new technology and like Web3 is so exciting and like so many people's lives have been changed in such a short period of time, like people really come with these like crazy expectations that 
their lives are going to change overnight. And it does, it causes, I mean, for the like, I don't, 1% of people who like that does happen for, amazing. For like the 99% of people who get disappointed, like, yeah, depression. I, I, I think it's, I, I, I think it's like not that, uh, you know, hard to understand why it happens. Um, and then, like, people really, they still underestimate the, like, the bull and bear cycles. To me, like, I, I almost can't believe this just from, like, a, a capitalism perspective. I mean, like, capitalism is, like, 300 years old. Like, you think we would have figured out how to, like, have just, like, steady growth instead of, like, crazy up, crazy down. But, like, still, it's just the same thing happens every, every 10 years or, like, every 20 years, whatever it is. I mean, it's, like, it's better in traditional markets than it is in crypto. But, yeah, I, I think, like, that's really stressful and that's like really, really hard. I mean, even me, like this is my second cycle. This is my second cycle where like not only is like almost our, like all of my assets are invested in crypto, but like my whole career and like basically everything I own. And like, even for me, I'm like, damn, this sucks, you know? Like, <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, yeah, I, I think like misaligned expectations are like the root of like the, the brewing mental health crisis and, and discord, those two things. <laughs> Capitalism and discord. <laughs> yes. What Duncan said. Um, yeah, I mean, it's funny because we could get real existential when, when we start to talk about, like, how do you stay grounded? Because I remember saying things earlier in my life, like, whose calendar are we on anyway? Like, you know, people, because I, I celebrate my birthday for an entire month. I just, I do what I want. Like, Happy birthday, by the way. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Yeah, no, but, but that's the way I think about it. It's like, you, the rules exist for those who believe in them. And I've learned to operate in a way where like, I am very aware that these rules are made up by some man. And I'm saying that because generally it is a man who's making the rules, right? Um, but... That being the understanding, we're in a new space where there are no bosses, no one owns Web3. So like, who's to say that I need to follow anybody's rule, right? So, you know, I, I was lucky enough to stumble into crypto very early. I think 2013, I like had two Bitcoin for $75 each. Like I was trying to purchase something and I was like, I didn't even purchase the thing. And then two years later, I kept seeing Bitcoin in the news and I like go through old emails and I find them and they're like 600 each and then I quickly sell them because I don't know any better. That's when I bought Yeah, I, I bought your bag. You know? But then you, you bought my Bitcoin, right? And so, but that's the thing is like, I feel this obligation to be the person I wish I had met in 2016. And so the way that I operate in this space is like, I'm very chill about missed opportunities. Because you FOMO into trouble, you FOMO into like getting scammed, getting fished, rugged, whatever. I think about it in respect to like, I've missed so many opportunities. The market crashed in 2018, I could have bought a home, like a four story home, but I was like at a new job and I didn't make the right choice. So it's like, you're gonna miss shit. Fuck it. <laughs> There's more shit. And that's the thing is like, how old do you think you're gonna live to be? Because if you think you're gonna live to be, you know, two years older than you are today, that's how you operate. And I look at it like, this isn't going anywhere. I've watched, I'm a little bit older than some of you maybe, but I've watched like web two turn to web three. I've watched web one turn to web two. And so I'm like, that's a, we got at least 20 years before this thing you know, has another iteration. So why rush? Why think that this is a glass ceiling that's gonna, you know, it's a bubble that's gonna burst? Of course it's a bubble that's gonna burst, but it's not going to burst to the degree that you won't be able to, to still contribute and participate in a way that benefits you. If you want to make a kajillion dollars tomorrow, good fucking luck. I don't think that there's a plan for that, but like the lottery is like $800 million tonight, so go play that if you just want to gamble, right? But the reality of it is invest in a way that gives you, you know, a 10-year plan and say like, I'm going to approach this thing because I care about this and not like I'm going to quickly flip these six projects, like there's no way to predict any of that. And so I'm pretty cool because I let go of all of that, right? Like I just kind of push it to the wayside. Like I've missed, I'm in like alpha chats and like people like, I'm buying this, I'm buying that. And then it's like to the moon. And I'm like, I just missed like $7,000. But guess what? I'm going to miss $7,000. 
every other day, there's always something that's happening that I don't know about. So I, I acquiesce to like accept that that is the reality of the space and think about the longer term vision. Like what, what am I doing in this space that's going to bring me a sense of, of value, right? Like I want to look at it like I'm building legacy. And if I'm going to be participating in things that I care about, I can't be willy nilly throwing all of my cash at whatever somebody who I don't really know suggests. So yeah, when it comes to like the mental health stuff, I kind of like get this idea of like, if, it, if I'm not there, it's not happening, <laughs> right? Like that's how I have to look at it. It's just like, if I'm not there, it's just not, it's not popping. It's not the thing. And many people will, will win and that's great, but there will be an opportunity for me to, to capitalize in a way that is actually meant for me and not like my homies. You know what I mean? Like you, you, can't, you can't benefit every opportunity in the way that everybody else does. You kind of have to like focus on the thing that you're gonna do in this space and the rest of it can fall off. So I want to preface this by saying that I do struggle with my mental health, and I have since I was, you know, a teenager, and that's very normal, and it should be talked about, and people should be able to talk about those things without feeling the stigma of not being as efficient a cog in society just because they struggle with mental health issues. So I wanted to firstly say that, and secondly, yes. thank you. Because I know that every single person has something that they struggle with, and it should not be a determination of your ability to do your job well. It's so important. And it just, just tell yourself that. If you tell yourself anything based on what I said, that, tell, tell yourself <laughs> yeah. that. I'm not going to speak for anyone else. Um, but yes, yeah, so I, I, I do want to say that there is this, <clears throat> to echo what... what um, the other amazing folks just said, it's, there's this unrealistic expectation of you buy this NFT, you flip it, and now you could buy a yacht. <laughs> and that has pervaded since, you know, the last, last summer around this time when things were pretty high and people were pretty, pretty, you know, soaked in with, you know, bored apes becoming this ridiculous flip with cool cats becoming a, you know, crazy flip with pretty much every project becoming a ridiculous flip. And if you weren't hodling, you were a failure. And <laughs> if you didn't hold S till 10K or zero, you suck. And there was definitely this unhealthy vibe around taking profits, around, um, you know, securing yourself in your own financial best interests that I also fell victim to when I was an artist and I finally made some money. I should have cashed out 50% for taxes. I should have just done these basic things that, you know, just, to, just basic, like, you know, okay, you make money, you're going to put some money away because you have to pay taxes on that. I feel like everybody forgot about taxes. <laughs> it just feels like, yeah, it's just, just in general. And, and then, you know, everybody got wrecked and, I mean, still continue. Everybody will continue to get wrecked. I think we should always count on the tax man getting, getting their money. Um, so we should account for that, even though it's not sexy, like most of the things I just said. But um, just in general, there, there, there's, there's this expectation um, that we don't need to hold on to, that because one person was able to flip their board ape and buy a yacht, that I should be able to do that too. Um, and, and I think that, that and letting go of um, the crazy disparity in wins and losses and also celebrating the crazy wins and losses, um, which happen to be the most noteworthy things in the media, which also doesn't help um, the, 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 the face of NFTs in general, um, and, and, and the conversation, the polarizing conversation about how ultimately good and ultimately bad they could be for people, um, just paints even more of a picture of this social media hell of um, what NFTs are and you know, more of disparity in the world that we, we, we absolutely don't need. So I think that putting your blinders on in some way and, and, and sticking to what you know is good for you and what you need for yourself is the most important part of that. And that I learned that 
slowly. Um, as the market crashed, I was like, okay, I'm gonna um, cash out, so I'm 97% stable coin, and most of the money's in the bank, and I feel very good about that, especially for my brand that I'm trying to build. You know, you need, like, at the end of the day, you need to pay things in fiat, so it's very important to, to keep that in mind as well when you're building your project or, or selling your work and, and, and paying your contractors. And at, at a certain point, the volatility of, of the market um, needs to, to come down back to earth. So. 100%. Give it up for Gossamer there. Yeah. I think there's some, some really great points and, you know, some, some things I've been thought about as well, you know, when, when new friends or new people have asked me about getting into NFTs and the like, my first thing is, I always say is, don't invest more than you can afford to lose, which is easier said than done. But when you actually do do that, it makes it a lot easier to weather the cycles. You know, this, this is my third crypto cycle. And, you know, when I bought Bitcoin in 2013 and it crashed, I had, I didn't necessarily have the conviction that it was coming back. I thought I'd hold on to it because I believe in the technology. But after the second cycle, I was like, okay, maybe I was on to something. And then the third cycle, it's like you start to learn. And so I, I do think that this is a learning, this is always a learning process. And if you, if you do, as long as you don't overextend yourself, as long as you survive and, and, and live to fight another day, like one of those days will be yours, you know? Um, and so I, I think that's one of the most important things is just balancing your portfolio, being really prudent about that, remembering taxes as, as mundane and as, as, as uh, not fun as it is, and, um, and just sort of, you know, sometimes slow and steady will get you where you need to be with a long-term perspective. Um, speaking of sort of the ebbs and the flows of both bulls and bears, um, you know, bear markets do have ramifications, and we've seen a lot of news. Um, you know, OpenSea had to cut 20% of their staff. Um, you know, Nifty Gateway was impacted by Gemini's uh, having to make cuts as well, um, and, and many other companies that are weathering this downturn. So, Duncan, I'd love to hear your thoughts as a founder um, and as a leader. Um, how do you lead a company through the ebbs and the flows of the bulls and the bears in such a volatile context like crypto and NFTs? Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I think it's like, it's honestly genuinely difficult. Um, I, I think most businesses, <clears throat> there, there are a few businesses where like your revenue is as volatile as it is in crypto. And, you know, like you look at trade volumes now compared to a year and a half ago, they're down like 80, 90%. And, you know, like Coinbase, like the 90, I, I, I don't know what it is, but like 95, 97% of their revenue is, it comes from trade volumes. So like, it's, it's a pretty simple like relationship between trade volumes and their revenue. And th there's few businesses that have to deal with market cycles like that. You know, you like it generally your, your revenue doesn't go down 80 or, or 90%. And that, that really is hard to prepare for. Um, I mean, I think yeah, we were just impacted by like, you know, we did have to, to fire some people. Like, I, I honestly think that's the worst part of, of running a company. It's just like absolutely a, a terrible experience. Um, and you know, this is why I'm so mad at capitalism, right? I'm like, can't we just figure out this boom and bust cycle and just have one? <laughs> like, can't we just have like an up cycle instead of like this crazy, but we, we still have the boom and bust cycle. Um, I, I think, uh, you know, it re really like the thing I keep coming back to is like, we have to move crypto beyond this like purely, it, it's not purely speculative, but it's so speculative right now. We have to move into like things that are, are less speculative and things that like people really derive value from. And, and so much of this is like, it's such a young industry. You know, it's, it's, uh, we, we still have so much to figure out before we can like get to a stable place. And you know, you look at the birth of other industries and they were also amazingly speculative. And I think like, I don't know what the stat is, but there were, there were 2,000 car companies founded, and out of those, there have only been two that have never declared bankruptcy. It's like, it's insane, you know, like the, like people it, in an emerging industry like this, it's really, really hard to build a business. Um, but that, that's what we keep coming back to, and that's why like, you know, as I mentioned earlier, closing the passion gap I think is important. If you look at the amount of money people spend on physical art every year, it's actually pretty steady. It, it grows like, you know, five to 15%, and, and art has been in like a really healthy, you know, up market for like 40 or 50 years, but it, it really doesn't experience the same boom and bust cycles that NFTs does or like nowhere close because most people are just buying it because they like, they love it and they think it looks nice on their walls. Like I want to get to that place with NFTs. Um, 
you know, I think we'll, I think we'll get there in, in a period of time. And like, once we get there, we'll, we'll, we will have steadier businesses that are not subject to these insane cycles, but yeah, it'll, it'll just take time. Um, I, I don't really know how you hurry that along because, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, still so many people come into NFTs right now with, with crazy expectations and so many people come in expecting to flip and, and buy a yacht overnight, you know, it's, um, and like until people are just, until people view an NFT as like, oh, I'll buy it because I love it. And like, yeah, I, I, I'm going to hang this up and I think it looks nice and I, I really like looking at it. You know, I, I think it's going to be really hard. Um, I think anyone specifically, if you're trying to weather a downturn like this and, you know, you do find yourself in a position where you have to lay people off. Um, I, I feel for you. It's, it's, on a, it's, it's tough. Like, there's no other way to put it. Um, and I, I feel for OpenSea. Like, I know Coinbase had to lay people off. It's, it's just genuinely difficult. There's really no way around it. So that's what I would say. Yeah, no, very, very, very pertinent points um, for what we're going through right now. Um, Mech, you know, you are such an accomplished community builder. And community has you know, it is both simultaneously like a overused buzzword to the point of parody in the NFT space, as well as still an incredibly important pillar of actually finding success in the, in the NFT space. So I'd love to hear your perspective. Like, how do you define community for yourself? And what are, what have you seen work? Like, what are, how, how can people build it sustainably? I'm, I'm thinking about what, what Duncan was just saying. And I think, like, the way that I define community is, you know, um, it's a group of people who have a shared interest at, at the core, right? Um, so it could be a community built around any idea or cause. I, I like to look at it from the perspective of a cause. I like to think about it in the perspective of a cause because in order to, to close that passion gap, in order to get to a place where people are treating NFTs as less for capitalization and more for actual building of things, we need to get there, right? Like we need to be thinking about, I'm buying this because I want to support this cause, right? And so I think about it from that perspective because that's the way that I, that I believe that it becomes a more productive space. And so, you know, when, when people who are coming into this space are, are being lured in by, you know, the headline of like this thing sold for this much and they're like, oh, I'm gonna come here and make money, it's not a bad thing. It's not to say that you can't make money and that's not what you should be doing. It's just the and part, right? I think so many people come in thinking it's an either or and they're saying, I'm going to go into this space to make money. And then the other side of it is I'm here to do good. And it's like, what happened to the and? Do both. Make a shit ton of money and do good, right? Because that's what this space provides the opportunity for. Um, and so I think a lot about like, galvanizing a, a group of people who, like I said, have a shared interest or pain point. I, I think more so about pain points because I'm speaking more for marginalized people. I think a lot about the folks who are not being heard because they're not here in volume. And so, you know, that's women, that's queer folks, that's people of color, that's a lot of groups that would be othered in the conversations that happen on a daily basis. So for me, it's like, being able to have access to a stage and be a part of a conversation that would otherwise just be a bunch of white guys, right? Like sometimes the optics of that is just, I'm getting DMs in the back channel from people who are like, I'm so glad you said that. I'm so glad you're up there. You're saying exactly what I'm thinking. And it's like, yeah, because if you can't be a representative for those who don't have enough of a voice to speak loudly enough, then who's to know what the problems that we're facing even look like, right? Like it's part of my, role as an educator is, you know, giving people optics into what this space provides, explaining to them the importance of a smart contract and the, the benefits of learning some of the, you know, technical things that they might otherwise overlook because they, they're not a technical person. But then it's also like advocating for those people who are maybe not even of, like, they don't have good internet or good technology, right? And then it's, on the other side of that conversation, talking to the people who have the capacity to impact that, to have a benefit to those people who are not even aware that they could be helping because they are so far removed. It's like, if you live in Beverly Hills, what do you know about homelessness, right? Like if you never drive through, you know, like that part of town, how do you have context for what that looks like? And so it requires 
people like me to be in the space to say like, hey, look, this is something that people are dealing with. And I know you can hear me, so I'm going to talk about it. And maybe I'm not like directly feeling the brunt of it because I operate in a way that has allowed me to circumvent it. I still know what it looks like. I still recognize it and I can see it and the people I care about are being impacted by it. So what could you do to help? And so, yeah, for me, it's, it's really interesting to think about like how people-centric the space is. And for me, community is really just communicating those ideas through that group of people, right? So it's those who are within that community and understand that being as vocal as they can to those who don't understand that and, that, and hopefully finding allies that take the, those issues up as their own because that's how change happens. Like it can't just be the people who are hurt talking about being hurt together, right? Like that, that doesn't solve the problem. And so the idea that you advocate and you bring in more people who have that shared pain point to the point where the squeaky wheel finally gets some oil, that's when the change happens. So I'm, I'm like a, I'm a, I'm a oil baron. <laughs> I love like, that. I love like that analogy. Lo Low-key trying to like mine for oil. I want more oil on these squeaky wheels. <laughs> there it is. There it is. Uh, our final question of the evening, Gossamer. W before you entered the NFT space, um, you, no, you, you were a tattoo artist. And I'd love to hear your thoughts on how this technology can empower artists in that space. Oh, boy. Um, yeah, this is something I've thought about a lot, um, especially um, since tattooing is one of the few art forms that require a service type um, performance. Uh, and I say performance just because you, you, you need another person to perform and create this artwork. Um, obviously, I've tattooed myself a lot, so it's not always required, but in a general sense, it's something that requires at least two people um, to make happen this type of artwork. And, and, and that does pigeonhole a lot of tattoo artists in um, the service industry, um, which, which makes them you know, kind of along the same lines of you know, people who um, do hair and makeup and, and different kinds of um, other art forms in the industry, which have varying income levels depending upon what kind of um, clientele you're serving, whether it's doing makeup and, and hair for, for celebrities or for, for fashion, for shows, for um, television, for movies, um, or, 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 or otherwise, um, or just for ordinary people. Um, there's all sorts of different income levels for um, tattoo artists as well. There's tattoo artists who are quite famous and are able to tattoo, um, have a clientele um, which range from you know, fashion designers to um, very famous um, 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 celebrities and, and actors and such, um, to people who just work at um, your local tattoo shop and they just take in work and will tattoo um, any type of art style that, they, that, that, that their client wants. Um, so not only is there, um, and, and this is something I think a lot of people don't, don't, who aren't very deep into tattoos don't realize that there's two very distinct groups of artists who tattoo. So there are artists, um, I'll use myself as an example. I have a very full formed artistic style, very specific artistic um, you know, work that I do that is pretty much stays in line with that artistic style and I don't deviate from that very much um, when it comes to working with clients. Um, and then there are tattoo artists who specifically tattoo for the purpose of um, you know, that is the job that they, that they perform. They may not have a full, they may not be like artistic thinkers outside of just doing client work. And there's, there's obviously lots of designers and illustrators and, and other, uh, other folks um, in different industries who do work for hire and they specifically do that and they don't have their own personal body of work. And that's totally fine. Um, I, I think that there's an opportunity for NFTs to both empower people who tattoo um, to tattoo um, and, and, and I feel like that could be more of like either some kind of subscription model or something that benefits um, the artist or having some kind of token that, that um, may tie their work in some way to appreciate over time, whether it's, you know, some kind of, I feel like probably the best way would be like what restaurants are doing, because that's also a, diff a similar type of service industry. Um, with experimenting with tokens and, and things like that. 
Um, and then on the other hand, there are artists um, like me who do something more specific to providing a digital authentication and a digital art piece that goes along with the piece that um, has also been tattooed on the, art, on the, on the client. Um, and I've, I have done one of those before back in um, May of 2021, very early, I think. I think it was probably like too early for it. <laughs> um, um, but yes, I had a client who bought an NFT, which did come with the tattoo, and we did do both pieces, which was very exciting. Um, it was a very, very cool project, but again, it's a, I, I feel like I haven't adopted it in a larger sense simply because I do many different other mediums, um, and I'm not limited to tattooing as the only avenue of creating art, like some artists may be. Um, and there are a couple different projects that are happening now, which I think it's good that they're getting traction, such as Scab Shop, um, which does have a lot of uh, veteran tattoo artists from the industry who have very famous art styles, who are very familiar with doing client work, where they are selling their tattoos that come with... Um, with a, a digital token in a sense, which I think is, is definitely a, a great option for folks who um, are trying to find different ways of taking something that is um, within the service industry um, and, and, and providing something that um, may be another piece of merchandise that can appreciate over time or can just be a, a, a beautiful um, memento and keepsake that goes along with um, their art that which is on their body and I think nowadays uh, especially in the last um, at least ten uh, five ten years um, fine art um, which has been tattooed on, on folks bodies has been very popular um, mostly I, I think a lot of it has to do with um, just having less physical things which is very much in line with um, nfts and having less physical pieces of art um, being able to 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 just be able to pack up a move or show off your, your assets, your different artwork, um, anywhere, anytime you want. And I, and I think that they do coincide quite a bit. And I am excited to see what happens next in that industry. So are we. We are at time, everyone. Give it up for our incredible panelists. Wow, what an incredible panel. It was amazing getting so many diverse perspectives from the platform side to the artist side to the community building side. It takes a team in the NFT space, and I love the conversation we had today. Uh, before I tune out, please be sure to subscribe to our newsletter at nftnow.com. Each week, we simplify all the crazy things happening in the NFT space and actionable insights straight to your inbox. Without any further ado, we will catch you next time on the NFT Now podcast.